Hey folks, welcome to Dojo Talks. This is our uh, podcast that we record live and then uh, release on YouTube, Spotify, and uh, many other places. Um, today we are going to be discussing the recent decision by the FIDE Ethics Commission to ban Kriakin from professional chess for, they said it was six months, um, which includes probably most importantly the upcoming candidates tournament that Kriakin was already uh qualified for. Um, so huge loss for him to, to lose his candidate spot. And uh, this has definitely sparked off a debate as to whether or not FIDE, um, I guess, was correct to do this, whether they have the right to, let's say, punish a player. Uh, we should make it very clear, you know, they punished him specifically because of things he was saying on social media and uh, his support um, of, uh, of Putin's uh, war uh, and, and Putin specifically. Um, so I don't think we're going to get into the politics too much today. I think today we're focusing on FIDE's role in all this. We actually did a previous episode um, on this topic uh, before the ban happened, discussing what FIDE should be doing, whether they should be banning Russian players and so on. Um, today, I guess we're discussing this one thing about whether FIDE should have the right to like sanction a player, um, let's say, for what they're saying and, and not like they're, let's say, like, you know, they're not cheating or, or anything like that. Um, so, Jesse, I think this was your, you definitely wanted to talk about this. Right. So let me throw it to you. You uh, seem to think, uh, you know, I'll just let you say it, whatever you want to say. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, to be clear, I pushed for this and David and uh, in particular was just like, dude, I'm just done <laughs> talking about cardiac and I don't want to talk about the guy anymore. And I am not that interested in talking about Karyakin. Um, I think though that this is a really interesting precedent that pertains not just to the chess world, but to let's say global sport and how we deal with cases like this. And so I guess in my head, there is a historical component, i.e. historical precedents. There, are, um, there is a moral component, obviously, and um, obviously political component, but I, uh, let's say philosophical component, just how you deal with stuff like this. So um, let's state some obvious things. Um, the world community has come up against what Putin's done in a way that is unprecedented in terms of the amount of pressure that's truly global pressure, not just worldwide, but just in every aspect of Russia's dealings, it's being put pressure on. And um, Karyakin's position was then, like Russian chess players already are having the possibility of just not playing anymore. That's on the horizon. But Karyakin, of course, exacerbated his position by saying, um, let's call it incendiary, incendiary social tweets, several of them, often several a day. Um, so that like, you know, accelerated the process of this already global pressure um, that we see not in the chess world, but if we think about sporting events, you know, they, Russia lost the, uh, they were going to play the Champions League final there in St. Petersburg, that was taken away. And now the World Cup coming up this summer, biggest event in sporting in the world sporting, you know, scene, they're out. Um, and it, what pertains to chess, the chess world with the with the soccer world is this like, they were gonna have to play um, matches, qualifying matches with Poland and other countries there. And it's just like the Poles were like, dude, no, <laughs> we can't do it. We can't, we can't play with these people, you know? And I think a very similar thing was going to happen with Karyakin and is going to happen with the other Russian players, many of whom are against the war. And I should say most of them are well-traveled and speak foreign languages and have access to media, which is not just in their country. Okay. So that's just like the broader picture. To me, um, I think where the counter argument to my mind really begins in what I think is a historical precedent. And this is gonna sound maybe dumb to some people, but to me, it starts with the idea of the ancient Greek Olympics in general, which is that 
you guys <laughs> imagine you've got two warring societies and you stop fighting to do the Olympics, right? And honestly, in terms of that historical precedent, they didn't always stop fighting. <laughs> We've got to say it wasn't some perfect idealized thing. No, they still sometimes didn't have their Olympic Games, but the idea was there. And that idea, honestly, is what carried over into the Olympics and other sporting events where you drop the whatever political stuff is going on. And that's um, why. Can I just ask you real yeah. quick for a clarification, yeah. Jesse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know for sure historically that the Greeks violated the? the uh, sort of religious ceasefire of the Olympics because the Olympics, it was a, it was even a religious thing, right? It was against yeah, yeah, yeah. God to fight people during the Olympics. So right, I think, do you I, know I, that they violated it for sure? I know that several Olympics didn't happen. Okay. You know, um, <laughs> kind of like, like react. It's not. Gotcha. So it's more like we're not willing to stop our war. So we won't start an Olympics and then, you know, upset God by continuing the war. Okay, that I mean, it's, it, and let's just say it's an amazing historical precedent, which is carried on just the idea of it, right, has carried on into moral philosophical considerations about sport, the way sport should be done and how it's above somehow some political thing. And hmm. so to bring it to a more recent example, I think is very important, is think about Fisher, 1972. This is before Fisher is saying truly crazy things. I mean, he's saying some crazy things, but they're not really political by 1972. But he's pulling all kinds of antics at the height, really, of the Vietnam War. There's a lot of similarities with the Vietnam War to the current Ukrainian situation. Um, we can talk about the differences, but that's not too important. Uh, and one thing I think is interesting about that situation with Fisher is you know, Spassky could have stopped the match at, at a variety of points. It was up to Spassky. The Russians wanted to shut it down. And there was ample opportunities for them to do so just on the antics that Fisher was pulling. And there was kind of this beautiful gesture of Spassky of like, well, I want to play, you know? And that's one of the reasons Spassky is like, you know, ends up living his life out in France because they just weren't, they weren't cool with it, man. The Soviets weren't cool with the move that he did. Yeah, yeah, he burned all his, all his bridges. And honestly, I really do think that when he does that, it's like there's a, a gesture to this tradition in sport that goes back to the beginning of sport in general, mm -hmm. where you're saying, okay, we're going to put aside all of this stuff for the sake of politics. Now, what I'm trying to do with this is I'm not actually trying to say that this is, means that we shouldn't have banned Karyakin. I, I'm just saying to me, it's a very controversial thing. Um, I was talking to my coach KGB and he's like, no, <laughs> people are dying. You have to pick sides. There is no, there is no like neutrality thing. It's not like one person saying this, one person saying that we can get along. No. So there's this, you know, other thing, which is very powerful is just like imagining uh, Ukrainians and Russians ever playing together, for example or, you know, being in a room with Karyakin. I mean, it is a tough, tough uh, call, you know? So I think it's interesting how, what really has happened to my mind when, when, when with this decision, it's like this new world stance where we're gonna say, the, we're putting such a global pressure on that it has, it's eliminated this ancient boundary of, letting letting sports people do sports stuff even at the height of conflict so you, just to back up like imagine it, uh, vietnam proxy war the russians are essentially fighting us using the vietnamese as the people launching their weapons in the same way that the ukrainians are using western weapons uh in ukraine with the important difference that basically ukraine is united whereas Vietnam was a civil war, essentially, with us taking one side. Um, I think Putin might have imagined, <laughs> might have imagined that Ukraine was going to become a civil war as well, and then it didn't really happen. So many, I, I'll, I can say more, but I'll let you guys respond however you want, and then we'll take it from there. So yeah, I, I just want to say, I mean, I feel like there, the Karakin thing is a little bit weird because there's a bigger issue at stake, which is like whether Russian players should be allowed to play in general 
which would totally trump anything that happens to Karyakin because right. um, there's definitely an argument to be made for just not allowing any, um, not just players to not be able to play under the Russian flag, but just not allowing anyone who like lives in Russia or identifies in Rus- as Russian as, in any way uh, to play. And, and the idea there is like, uh, that sports are very important uh, to to Russia's like image and their national image, and there's this idea of like sports washing where, mm. um, you know, the the powers that be can kind of pretend like everything is okay. They're still a part of the international community and so on. Whereas, uh, if you just continue this idea of like global isolation, then yeah, of course that includes like the the top sports um, athletes. So it it is a little strange to me because it's like. Uh, we might just end up banning all Russian players uh, in general, which would be very sad, but like, okay, people are dying, like it's an insane situation and so on. Um, when it comes to uh, just Karyak in, in general and like whether FIDE has like uh, the right to, to kind of sanction a player, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it seems like this is a very common thing, at least for uh, American sports organizations. There's a, you know, a certain um, importance of like off-field conduct and so, like, NBA players, NFL players, you know, they can't just do whatever they want or say whatever they want. Mm-hmm. They, in general, have to be good role models or they can expect to be fined or punished in some way um, by, by their organizations. And something to that makes sense. I mean, sports are essentially games. We're all playing for fun. We're very lucky that we get to play chess and, uh, and you know, enjoy this game as our, as our lifestyle. And so I think it's not too big of an ask. Uh, you know, to ask your professional players to be like good role models for for children, right? That just seems like a very natural thing. And so if someone is being, you know, extremely grotesque and like, you know, laughing about people getting killed, like his former like Ukrainian teammates having to take up arms, or if it was anything else that, you know, like is just so like publicly condemnable, just like extreme like racism, sexism, like all this stuff, like it makes sense that, yeah, FIDE is a professional organization, doesn't want to have to deal with someone who's not not a good person, you know, morally. All right. So if FIDE were run by a bunch of people who themselves were good moral people who were just <laughs> like, you know, a group of, you know, a large group of, of chess players, you know, a big council elected, you know, by other chess players every year or every couple of years, then like a lot of the stuff you're saying could make sense and there could be a role for them to say something. The problem is that in all these international organizations, they're, they're corrupt and it's political to determine who's in charge of them. And then they're going to make these essentially political decisions, right? W- whether or not we want them to be political decisions or not, or think they should have the prerogative, you have to understand that the people in charge of FIFA or the Olympic Committee or you know, the World Trade Organization or FIDE or any international body, United Nations, et cetera, the people running those things are politicians, right? They're people who have wormed their way into power and it reflects in a certain sense a a, a soft power, right? It's diplomatic power, not like bombs and and guns, right? But there is a constant battle for soft power just like there is for hard power, right? So so every every interest, whether it be a, a national government or a large corporation, is at all times trying to gain influence and power within these kinds of organizations, right? So if you look at how Dvorkovic became the leader of FIDE, you can see that there's all this controversial backstory. You guys read the article a few weeks ago, right? About how the Russian consulate was applying pressure through its consulate on national federations for them to vote for Dvorkovic, right? So diplomat to diplomat, go talk to the head of your national federation and then have your national federation vote for the leader of our national federation to head the international federation, right? And whether or not that succeeds and whether or not FIDE is, you know, ends up being pro-Russia or pro-Ukraine, et cetera, who's in charge and making the decisions at the IOC or FIDE or anywhere else just reflects who had the power and the maneuvers and the strategy and tactics to take over and penetrate all those international organizations. They're not just a collection of people who are interested in, in, in trade or people who are interested in chess or people who are interested in football, right? So, so the decisions they make are going to be inherently just reflecting the international you know, balance of power. So um, I want to throw in one clarification. Like this decision was made by the FIDE Ethics Commission, mm-hmm. who I think it's like 
three or four people. I don't know if they're elected or appointed, but they're not exactly like the, the power hungry people in FIDE necessarily. Maybe, but who, but, but how they got there is what I'm sort of stressing is very yeah, important, right? Mean they're, who yeah, are they and how did they get or... there? We don't know. There are three people, just three people. So if somebody wanted to control the process, you could imagine there would be many ways for somebody to stack that three card deck. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think they're like, like all their decisions are public, right? Like they, they have to write their their Same opinion like their opinion exactly sure yeah, so but the opinion can be wrong and reach the result they want right like the supreme court in the u.s reaches the wrong opinion anytime it wants to but they have really really long sentences to explain how they got there right but we yeah. should say one of the controversial things about the decision is the decision itself is a it seems to me like a compromise that doesn't make sense what am i talking about it's a six month sentence. So imagine other people have made this point. It's like, wait a second. You either like, he either did something really terrible in which case he gets more than six months or it's not enough and you give him nothing, right? So right. clearly on that committee, they were like, well, you know, somebody said, I'm not comfortable with this, but okay, six months. Yeah. And of course, the significance of the six months is that the candidates is coming up and right. that's like the biggest thing on the agenda. So they could just have like a problem with the organizer, take new bids, delay the tournament three months, and then he could play in it. <laughs> <laughs> in which case, maybe they would just extend the, the ban. But right. <laughs> then they would extend. We've revised our opinion and actually it should have been eight months, not six. <laughs> well, I think they should have just made it clear like six month ban and like ejected from the candidates whenever it happens right <laughs> but i don't know I'm, I'm with you jesse it is kind of a weird uh compromise um or maybe banned until he like retracts his statements and apologizes because like if what he's doing is wrong then how's it okay to like stand by it and like you know and then just come back a few months later saying saying ha ha i still believe what i said you know i spit on all of you it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, another really no. another historical um, thing we can think about is like by nineteen by the you know by the end of Fisher's life, that guy was saying all kinds of crazy stuff, mm -hmm. and people were dying for that guy to come and play. <laughs> they would have begged for that guy to come and play. Oh, what a thing it would have been for the chess world. They would never have thought of stopping that guy from playing just because he was saying crazy things. Yeah. Mm. And the other thing I want to say about this is I think that we got to just say that something there, there's like a, we call it a statistical tendency that of players who have reached near the top of the game, when they get older and maybe are waning in their powers, they tend, there's a, just an, a tendency that you see more than the general population of going off the deep end of crazy conspiratorial theories, right? Kramnik is starting to really lose his mind, my friends. Really? <laughs> I mean, it's like, he's, he's going off the deep end saying all kinds of crazy things. And I'm just saying like, there's something about these guys that like, especially like, I think part of it is you grow up in the chess world. You think you have the right to know things because people think of you as smart. So you have a instilled confidence, but you didn't go to college. You didn't go to normal school. You didn't read a lot of books. And so there's this kind of, uh, you know, you see something that you think is true and then you're going to grab onto it and start developing it as a theory. And I think that's at least my sense of what happens. And the reason I'm bringing it up here is this like, I, I mean, it, it from a distance, it looks like a guy like Karyakin is losing his mind, but it's he looks to me like he's losing his mind in a way that I've seen other chess players lose their mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Kasparov's another good example. I think he's clearly smart, not just chess smart. Like he's clearly got... You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, an engine yeah. running in his head, right? I mean, I think I think he's you know a genius, but he can still be wrong about tons of stuff if he's not you know well informed or hasn't thought through it or talked with other people who are smart and informed on those subjects. And Kasparov, like one thing that's interesting about like let's say 
the cultural differences that are a little bit at stake when trying to understand where Karyakin is coming from is like Kasparov, like Putin, has this belief in, let's call it numerology, right? There's this belief in round numbers. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but yeah. like people, uh, friends of Putin to get in his favor, like kill off his enemies on his birthday and like present it as like a birthday gift. But it's all about like this numer numerological stuff. And right. even like he does certain actions at certain times of the year. And this of course was like, you know, like, you know, uh, had to do with when Ukraine left the Soviet Union, the amount of the exact timing. There's all kinds of weird numerological stuff. And I think in mm -hmm. Russian, there's even some word like that means like round numbers or something. Anyways, Kasparov's deep in that. No, no, you're, you're right. Because Kasparov, I also heard him, he really likes the number like 13. He has 13. A lot of, um... Exact. Oh, dude. Yeah. No, Kasparov in the numerology, it goes deep. It goes deep. And it's an example of like, a of how chess players lose their lose their mind, but it's also there's weird cultural difference where the Russians are into that kind of weird thing. And for us, even like when you hear somebody talking about some numerological thing, I'm like, whoa, dude, take it easy. Yeah, take it or easy. or like astrological, right? You're talking to somebody, and then they mention like, oh yeah, you definitely you know shouldn't go do your shopping on Thursday because you know Aries will be rising. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think another important cultural difference be between, let's call it the West and Russia, that l feels like when we hear it, it just sounds so weird, but in a way it has to be, there, some kind of bridge has to be made is like, for most of the Russians and Soviets, there's just like a clear might is right doctrine. And we have trouble understanding it when they say it, and it almost feels like a joke when they say it, but they really do believe it. And they also have, I would call it a zero sum uh, approach to the world. That is, it's not like we can do an action and both of us win. No, there's only one winner. <laughs> there's only one winner whenever an action is taken, right? And they, and they can't imagine that somebody else could have a profitable outcome and they as well. It's like, no, there's only one who's gonna come out on top. And it's weird. It's when you hear it and it's just like, oh my gosh, is it real? But no, for them, it really is real. And so when Karyakin spouts a lot of this weird stuff, truly it's weird. But on the other hand, like he is parroting a lot of this stuff that he's hearing on this, the Russian social media, as well as the state media, which is like truly saying some crazy stuff. And so it's like, you know, in a lot of ways, he's just part of the hive mind thing that's going on in Russia. So we're punishing the hive mind that we can understand this is what it looks like a lot you know? yeah so my take is that you know we can talk about what should fide do or not but but to me the reality is that the people in charge of all the that it's always going to be people in charge of these organizations and they none of them are are qualified or selected in a way where you know i would trust them or want them to have the power to be deciding who is or isn't well, I, well, that's part of the thing. I don't think there's any, I don't think even if FIDE wasn't a historically corrupt institution, I would still feel uncomfortable with giving somebody that power. You know, it's, it's. Yeah. Weird. I mean, I would have to see a totally different profile of institution and different way of international organizations running before I would say, oh yeah, I could see how this organization would be qualified to make uh -huh. these kinds of decisions. Right, right, right. Right. But I've got another interesting question as a follow-up, maybe, uh -huh. if you guys want. Um, my thinking is this. Let's say FIDE didn't take any action on Karyakin mm -hmm. and other players wanted to shun him or not play him. Well, right? Yeah, I mean, how, what, what would that look like and, and what kind of decision should you make? If he shows up to the candidates and the other seven players don't show up, they're like, we don't want to play with this guy. He's just so disgusting. I don't want to be in a room with him. I don't want to play with him. I just, I don't want to see this guy. So the other seven players just go somewhere else and play a tournament by themselves. And he's the only one who shows up to FIDE's candidates event. You know, what does FIDE do then? Well, I think that's a, that was the precipitating thing that led uh, FIFA to cancel Russia being in the World Cup was the same thing. They were just like, no, the, the, like the Poles aren't going to play them in the qualifying matches. Forget about it. It's not going to happen, you know? So for them, it was like, well, that's the pressure we need to say, no, we're not going to do it, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, because I think, 
An- another way you could do it is like FIDE could have some kind of thing. Like if these players are complaining about somebody and don't want to play him, then there could be some way that FIDE says like, okay, because the players don't want to play this person, we're taking some kind of action. That could be reasonable. I mean, players could complain about how one player, you know, smells or dresses or, or, or talks during the games or whatever it might be, you know, and you can complain to an arbiter a few times, but at some point, like if you don't want to be around somebody, maybe you make some kind of a complaint to FIDE. Um, yeah. I think w- one of the weird things for me get is that like, if I'm going to really get behind the decision not to let him play, it has to be part of this sense of like, I'm being part of this global endeavor to just completely shut down any war, any this war, or any future war. I'm committing myself to being like, well, this is part of the global shutdown of mm-hmm. when you do this, this is what you're gonna face, right? It's not just one thing. To me, it's like, it's not just about, let's say the Ukrainian players not wanting to play the dude. It's like this incredible global pressure, which I'm not sure yet. I'm even convinced that it's gonna work or is working. It's an interest. It's an interest. I would call it part of a grand uh, worldwide experiment <laughs> we're doing now, right? There's a totally different uh, school of thought, which says trade is good for anybody to avoid war. Sport is good for anybody, any two nations trying to avoid, avoid war. And instead we're going on this more globalistic approach, which honestly, you know, maybe, maybe it is a good thing. Maybe China's not going to take over Taiwan or at least think twice about doing it, right? It, it, but I, I just wanna say it's an experiment to me. It's, I, don't, I've, I don't think there's been anything like it before in the past. Right. Yeah, it's definitely like a new situation. That's why I don't really, yeah, like buy all these arguments that like, okay, now FIDE just gets to ban like whoever they want for like whatever reason, like that's not gonna happen. <laughs> you know, like if tomorrow, like they just start like banning like Rajabov or someone else just like for something it's just like like no i think in this case it's just like so overwhelmingly clear that uh yeah number one i i would imagine very few players want to play against kriak in, in general um it's also just like very strange for them psychologically like they have to play against this uh this guy who's like super controversial and i don't know i'm sure it'd just be like a weird experience uh in general uh and not super fair for them um like he gets to play just, you know, no problem, uh, no consequences at home. While if people play him, they have to like possibly face consequences and people asking, why did you play him? You know, why didn't you, why did you not protest? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I feel like this one ban with, with Karyakin is absolutely fine. It might end up just being inconsequential if no Russians are allowed to play anyway. Um, I agree let, with let, you that it's rare. I don't see the slippery slope argument that they'll start banning everybody for it because I mean, they didn't even ban Shipov, right? With the same, on the same day. Yeah, they could have, yeah. No so problem. so if they didn't take any action against Shipov, that really says like, this is going to be pretty rare. Like they've just singled one person out and, you know, it might be another 20 years before they do it again. Yeah. And also what's going on with Karpov? Like, <laughs> is he's like, he's considered, you know, like an honorary figure and it sounds like he literally voted for the war and then voted for like reinforcements. Really? Here's here's an example of a of a slippery slope that honestly I think has to be discussed. So Radyubov, right, is uh, from Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, in very recent history, invaded and took over part of Armenia. Mm-hmm. Ivan's from Armenia. He's going to be potentially playing the event. Now. I do recall that Rajabov was, Rajabov is very Putin, very pro power and was very, you know, pro this war that happened not too long ago. Is it that much different? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. Especially if you're making incendiary comments on social media about how happy you are that the Armenians are getting, you know, getting it handed to them. And at that point, I don't think anyone even considered it. You know, I don't think I don't think it was even on the table as it because this idea of the like global pressure wasn't an option for the world at that point. Um, so, yeah, I think like if you start looking at historical examples of people saying crazy stuff that's very similar. Well, no, you got a lot. <laughs> you got a lot. 
you had a lot of stuff in that in that regard you know yeah so um i, I guess another clarification i wanted to make is that yeah it's not just like Karakin is being punished for his views like you can't lump you know all twitter views in one in one basket and just be like oh he's getting punished for like some tweets like we're not we're not talking about like pineapple pizza here right it's just like people are getting killed he's like supporting the war he's got thousands of followers he's saying like pro-war things he's saying you know like ukraine like should surrender he's and out he's giving like, like doing rallies like participating in rallies to yeah yeah pump up morale yeah boosting morale of soldiers who are then yeah. killing ukrainians yeah that would be like if a chess player went and gave a simul on some U.S. military base to a bunch of American soldiers, right? It would just be, you know, trying to increase their morale, get them in the mood to bomb people in other countries. It would just be beyond the pale. Well, during uh, an invasion, yeah, it would be. Well, the U.S. is always invading like 100 countries at a time. <laughs> They've got military bases occupying like 100 nations. Yeah, I mean, military bases, right? But it's not them invading it's an it's an invasion that's take. ongoing for a really 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 long time. They have an ongoing invasion of Hawaii and Puerto Rico and Texas and all, you know all over the place. The Philippines. I don't know. You might be right. I think we weren't supposed to get political. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm the point like is simply like that where I think. Karyak and sympathizers with land is like, wait a second, isn't this hypocritical? Because we have all these other examples and they're losing their mind because they're like, wait a second, look at all these other examples. And right, I, and the answer has to be, well, yeah, that was historical examples. And now this new level of anti-war sentiment is out there and it's kind of interesting and we're kind of running with it. And that's why Karyak, and it's not like it was anymore before. We're in a new world and maybe it's a cool thing, but it's, yeah, it's a new experiment, right? It is very new. Uh, and uh, yeah, very puzzling. I don't know. I don't know if there are any right answers. Uh, I do think it would have been really strange <laughs> to see him play the candidates. You know, it's just kind of, it's odd. It's odd to ignore things. Um, Cause that would, that would, what it would be like if Fide just like kind of ignored it and just said like, yep, if you qualify, you get to play, you get to do whatever you want, you know, as long as you don't cheat uh, in a tournament. And I don't know, just kind of like ignoring the, uh, the global events just seemed, uh, just seems very strange. And one yeah. thing, let's just put this out there this is more of a question or just an ongoing thing. It's quite possible that this war could just be going on forever. You know, I'm hopeful that, it, you know, there's signs that maybe it won't last forever, but it's quite possible it could last for a very long time, uh, just because it's hard to imagine Putin pulling back, right? So at that point, like then all of these Russian players, many of whom are now living abroad, what happens to them? Are we really going to say they can't play, especially imagine if it's a long drawn out event? It's hard to imagine stopping them from playing but i think that's what's on the table that like that's it. another thing i mean if they didn't ban sheepo i don't think they're, they're going to ban all russian players <laughs> i don't know i don't know it's very uh it's very close i think including those who've come out in public against the war i think that's the it's on the table for sure it's on the table i don't think they want to do it i'd be i'd be really, really surprised I'd be really surprised. Uh, I feel like it would kind of depend on what happens in the rest of the world. I mean, if, you know, if Russians are just banned across every other sport everywhere, like, it'd be very strange for chess not to follow suit. Right. I mean, think about it this way, David. Like, at the moment, you're not even allowed to do any kind of business with Russians. It's actually just illegal, right? You can't pay a Russian an appearance fee. No. You're not that's what? no, that's that's now illegal. That's now wait a illegal. minute, that's wait a minute. Of... Like if a Russian were traveling in the US right now, right? Yeah. Like if if Dubov were in California, I couldn't yeah, I don't think I couldn't I, think... I couldn't pay him to give a lecture at a local chess club or something. No, I don't think so. That's part I think of the there's global a specific sanction. sanction list. There's a specific list of like billionaires and their families. I don't think it's just no, anybody. It's, it is global, my friend. No, it no, I global. don't. I don't think that's right. I mean, our, our chat is disagreeing. And usually if <laughs> multiple people are like disagreeing, they're probably 
I don't know. That's my yeah, sense. Why would, why would there be a specific sanction list if it's just you're not allowed to do business with any Russians? They won't even need the list, right? Yeah. Um, no, you're not. I mean, we can look it up later. Oh, but oh I know something else. I know something what do, what else. You know? Chess.com you know? is still paying its Russian employees. Interesting. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So there's no way there's a full blanket ban. Well, for example, I can say uh, YouTube has completely pulled out. You, they're not paying Russians anything. PayPal's moved out. All the credit card businesses have moved out. So, you, you know, it's a very, <laughs> sanctions go deep, my friend. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed, you can't use any finance. Like, like, let's put it this way. Yeah. Duboff doesn't have a credit card he can use if you wanted to pay him. You mm -hmm. can't use PayPal to pay him either, you know. Right. So it, it's, it's really tough, man. And mm. and there's no there's no airlines leaving, there's no airlines going into Moscow or leaving Moscow. Maybe I guess take it back. You can go from Turkey, <laughs> from Turkey, and then you can go in. I think that's your one way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think Dubov, in fact, did something like that to get to, you know, all these tournaments. Yeah, I mean, it would be it would be a real bummer. Again, the idea is just like just not to give Russia any kind of uh sporting heroes because even if someone gets to play under a fide flag or whatever when they come home like they're still going to be russian they're still going to be a sports star they might get asked to meet with putin they might not be able to to reject that offer you know i mean it's just but like then but then the i mean if it were just that they could be used right if it weren't that karyakin is specifically like agitating right I mean, that if, if we're talking blanket bans of like anyone from a country, I mean, then think any conflict you have in the world right now, right? Ethiopia, Yemen, Israel, Palestine, like any of those places, you just, nobody can play from those countries because someone from the other side of the conflict, you know, thinks that FIDE should ban them all. No, I mean, I, I think Russian players should be allowed to play. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm just saying I would understand why they were banned. Like I understand the other side of the argument as right. a chess player. I but I'm just saying you could see banned. where that would go then, right? Like it could just like anybody who doesn't like the policies of any country could try to get the players from that country banned, right? And I'm not saying I'm not gonna try and say who's right or wrong in you know 20 conflicts I don't know about around the world. I'm just gonna say like there's probably like 20 conflicts around the world right now, right? Or wars, sorry. I don't want, don't want to do that thing where you call it a conflict instead of a war. There's probably, you know, 20, you know, bombings, shootings, whatever is going on somewhere in the world. Right. Um, and whoever's on the and, and anyone in any of those conflicts could try and get the other side banned from FIDE, FIFA, IOC, et cetera. It seems like that would just go crazy. For sure. I also think it's like it's I don't know. To me, it seems like a good thing when uh someone like Grischuk speaks out like against the war like very publicly right it feels like a lot of russians would see that speech and maybe would be affected by it mm -hmm. um so yeah to me personally i feel like especially if they're like against the war you know like uh, and, and they want to play and, and be brave i mean i think they should be given that that opportunity um but uh but yeah but your argument that like yeah fide could then be asked to you know, punish all sorts of place, places. I think that's fair. I mean, I think here again, the case is that it's just like a global effort that Russia is being isolated. So it would, I think, only happen in the event of another kind of global, uh, like, yeah, if China were to invade Taiwan or something, and then everyone is kind of globally against that, right? Like, um, then uh, it would, again, it's like the first time this is happening right, <laughs> that I remember where like FIDE is so involved in, in, uh, in this controversy uh, where like it's so close to, uh, to the players. Yeah. Um, Let me extend it even further for you also, Kostya. Like, and yeah. I think this will be not unreasonable, this extension, right? But 150 countries could get together and say the US and China are each polluting too much, too much CO2, which is ultimately going to have impacts comparable to war, right? They could even say worse, right? These are going to hurt the carrying capacity of the earth by 3 billion people or, 
you know, like we're losing land to flooding or this or that, right? So you have like 150 countries come together and say like, we want the US and China like banned until they reduce their emissions, you know, since they're not going along with international protocols on those kinds of things. That sounds like a reasonable ask. I mean, we're killing yeah. the... <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty serious, you know, or at least, you know, some people would think it's pretty serious. So... Mm -hmm. Um, no, I think it would be strange to ban American players in that in that case as well. I think then what you're getting into is you're asking three random people at FIDE to take the place of like the international courts, so to speak, right? They're supposed to like, they're supposed to do the job of the Hague now at every single one of these international organizations because they now have to arbitrate and like judge all these political questions and you know, then you're going to have to have lawyers going in there and arguing and economic impacts calculated out or environmental impacts. It's complicated stuff. I, I understand. I mean, it's very different, right? It's like when we compare an ongoing war with like global warming, that's like very like far off into the future. It's like hard for humans to appreciate like the gravity of the, the situation. But if 150 countries like came together and there is this like worldwide, you know, like protest event like that the u.s china or whoever are just like having too many emissions polluting the environment too much that would be a pretty big deal like yeah like if it affects fide to the point where you know americans are getting banned from traveling americans are getting sanctioned you know in terms of payment then yeah maybe they would eventually yeah. but yeah it's like we're very far off from that my understanding is that there have been some and I, I'm not an expert on this, but there's been some movements of that kind, like in the UN, but the US sort of set up the UN. So they've got veto power over anything that would matter. Right. But if you just start going through FIFA and, and other international organizations, especially any organization with one country, one vote, um, then like all these things could be used in that kind of weird soft power way. I guess, I don't know. It just seems very unlikely. Um, and it's, and yeah, I mean, already with this thing, like we have lots of very reasonable chess players that are not like, you know, supporting Russia in any way, but saying like Karyakin should not be banned. Like he, it's a sport he should be able to play. And mm -hmm. in this case, I feel like, you know, it's like hard to imagine a case where a better case where a player should be banned. Like It's hard to yeah. imagine what he would have to do um, to, to further warrant um, the ban. So yeah, if it was some for like something that i don't know it's like just not so publicly uh condemned then yeah i don't know it'd be strange to see fide act on that and i think they would see a lot of pushback yeah i'm i'm with uh i think i'm really closely aligned with somebody in chat who said that they would like to see it come from like the players and the organizers instead of from the fide officials the protest itself, the, 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 you know, the refusal to, to deal with someone like Karyakin or something like that. I'd rather see it like decided by like a bunch of people who I know are in the chess world than three names I've never heard of, um, from, from FIDE. But yeah, like the organizers up. are usually private people. And I think there's no dis disagreement. Like they could stop anyone from playing. In yeah. The and a lot of them have, and I'm very cool with that. Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, we're talking about the answer that FIDE is organizing. Right. Yeah. And so I'm just, FIDE is not, yeah, FIDE is like not really a private organization in that sense, right? And are they, is a, yeah. Yeah. I'm just not down with, with FIDE doing it. I just, I don't trust them to do it, you know? And there's an interesting comment in chat just now saying like, it's going to be funny to watch FIDE talk about how they need to be apolitical the next time a country other than Russia does something wrong, right? Suddenly they'll be like, oh, we have to stay out of politics. You know, we're just going to let People do what they do and say what they say. Well, We're just running chess. Let's be clear. I mean, Russia and previously the Soviet Union were in control of FIDE. In a certain sense, they still are. The head yeah. of FIDE is, they're like a Russian henchman, a Putin guy. So it's not like we're like, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's part of the stunning, that's, that's shocking. Yeah. That's shocking, yeah. I mean, you could have almost expected them to ban Ukrainian players for the oppression of ethnic Russians in Donbass or something, right? If 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 Russia had really fully penetrated FIDE correctly at this point. And honestly, let me just say, I think one of the interesting things, like if I'm going to believe in this of punishing Karyakin, like where it gets interesting is, for example, I'm a I've since uh, we got an American stalker star and he went to go play for Chelsea. Chelsea owned by a Russian oligarch. 
because of the UK sanctions, that guy had to do a fire sale on Chelsea. Huge soccer club, billions of dollars, yada, yada. That guy, Roman Abramovich, one of the key like Russian oligarchs, he's like living outside of that bubble. His daughter is like totally anti-war. The club is anti-war. He's getting his coconuts touched by this deal, by this epic sanctions push. If there's somebody, who can get to Putin, it's gonna be a guy like that who, who might be able to talk the dude down. And it's that kind of pressure that maybe might be able to do it. Similarly, right, with Vorkovich, the head of FIDE, this kind of pressure that he's facing, uh, like, you know, I mean, God, it's, I mean, he's gonna lose his spot too, eminently, is gonna, I don't think he's nearly as powerful as say Roman Abramovich, but he, I think he does, if he wanted to get five minutes of Putin's time, I think the guy could do it if anybody, right? Not close to him sitting on a table because it's 30 feet away, You'd probably get him on the phone though for five minutes if he really wanted, you know? That's the kind of pressure that if we're gonna believe that this has a positive effect, then it would be those elites in Russia whose, so, whose coconuts are really getting touched that is going to put the pressure on. Karyakin himself is just a pawn in this game, as far as I can tell, right? But guys like Dvorkovich have some pull in this oligarchical system that they got going on. And those are the guys, especially if there's some kind of coup or something, those are the guys that are going to be organizing, right? So if I'm going to believe in the sanctions thing, which honestly, like when you listen to interviews on the street of, of Russians, it's like, yeah, that, you know, they're just, they're just pissed. <laughs> they're just pissed. And they think like we're putting one over on them or something like that. We're doing something highly unfair. So the people aren't getting it, but maybe these oligarchs will get it. I don't know. Like I'm saying, it's like this huge thing, which is a departure, I think, from the way things have been done in the past. Yeah. And it's, I do think it's interesting because I, my whole life, I've been convinced that I was going to die much earlier from some thermonuclear blast. <laughs> I grew up 20 miles as the crow flies from Los Alamos, so I just assumed it was always going to happen. It's been amazing that I've been blessed to live in this time where there's been comparatively little war, especially compared to historically, uh, in terms of the world population, how much of the world population is at war. But I always felt like, oh my gosh, this thing is ready to blow. And of course, the whole thing about Ukraine, the really terrifying thing is we're not just talking about Ukraine, we're talking about the potential end of the world. As far as I could tell, that's, that's when I look at it, I'm not just worried about the Ukrainians, I'm worried about like, oh, this could be the end of it all, you know? Yeah, yeah that, that's the other side of this. It's like, you know, we, we spent this whole time talking about whether, you know, the ban is like fair to, to Karyakin, where it's like uh, some... I think, yeah, some Ukrainian players have already died. Like I saw there was like at least one like Ukrainian teacher I saw was uh, killed. Uh, I mean, thousands of Ukrainians dying. Like on the other side of the conflict, people are just dying. They can't play chess, you know, ever. So it's like, I don't know. It's like, uh, I feel like we have to balance the, the stakes for both sides. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, should we leave it there, my friends? I think uh, final thoughts. I think it's great for people on their own to try and balance things. You know, I would say like something like Grishuk by speaking out against it as a Russian, you know, arguably is doing more to fight against the against the war than anybody, you know, than any random chess player who's not from Russia or Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think we have to really respect. <laughs> very much you know any russians who are going against this and, yeah full you know I, yeah i think we could only hope to be as you know brave and powerful ourselves in our own countries as those people are and i gotta say like with the russians who aren't saying anything i'm sure even if they want i know there's a lot of them that probably want to say something but they're just like dude they're gonna they're gonna put me to the the gulag no, I, I they're just gonna they're just funny. gonna shit me out, man. Yeah, imagine I say if you something. have like a family and you say something and then you get oh, punished dude. for it. Like, what's the point? Yeah, it's brutal, dude. I'm afraid to say stuff in the U.S. and I would be much more afraid in Russia. Yeah.
You don't need that. What, what do you, <laughs> you've already said all the things you're going to say, boss. <laughs> you heard all the things you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe to you but not publicly uh-huh okay yeah no you're not afraid of saying anything but no this is a, we got to just say there's a completely different in kind navalny shipped off to a prison labor camp for nine years on i don't know what just get out of here buddy you're gone you're done yeah you know? well look it's not totally just saying level. stuff too jesse like I, well we don't need we'll get sidetracked here yeah. but but I mean, you know, when the U.S. is bombing other countries, like in addition to saying that you don't want them bombing other countries, another thought is to not send in your taxes because your money is paying for bombs to kill people. Right. So okay. I have considered whether I should pay taxes in the U.S. since by doing so, I'm, you know, becoming a, a collaborator. OK. Uh, and so. You know, but then I'm like, but if I, you know, don't pay my taxes, they take me away and my kids are, you know, all alone. And so, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, there's other things you can think about other than yeah, just, uh, you know, saying sure, if right, you're right, for right. or against something. Yeah. So. How are you guys? I think that was a <laughs> interesting talk. Yeah. No, I think I wanted to put it out there because I think it's going to come back and it's like this kind of sets the meditation stone for later, especially if, the, by the way, I did not see this come. I just want to say I did. And we talked about this, what, like when this first started about a month ago and we said something effective, well, Karyakin might not be able to play. And I was like, no, nah, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, it was on the table as a potentiality, but I really didn't think it was going to happen. I also don't kind of don't think that you could ban all Russians, but that might also happen, you know? So that's just definitely like things on the horizon here. Yeah. Yeah, it was very um, kind of, uh, yeah, sudden. Yeah, we talked right, I think as they were deciding, I think they announced that they were gonna discuss it um, with Karek and, and, um, and Shipov. Um, the non-ban of ship up is kind of weird, but I wonder if it's a non-ban, but if they're still going to invite them for like commentary and stuff. Um, now I have had, uh, just want to just say that I stopped following the Koryakin tweets, but my Russian speaking friends said what he said in a couple of those tweets was just simply untranslatably bad. So I just left it there. I was like, it's, it you know, beyond the limit of just saying something that was politically controversial, you know? And I think that's the difference, at least at the moment with Sheepoff, though he might end up going down too, right? Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, um, yeah, tough topic, but okay. It's, we had some good stuff in there. Um, that's going to do it for the show and the stream. Uh, so thanks everyone for tuning in and we will catch you guys next time.